All right, so I, don't um, I am Asif, and this is Steve, if you haven't figured that out yet. Um, <laughs> uh, we are really excited to be here uh, this evening with you to discuss uh, this topic of bullying. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's really a topic that means a lot to us. And, um, you know, uh, and we'll give examples, um, you know, from our own lives, um, you know, kind of to give you information about how it impacted us and how it impacts a lot of children out in the world. And, you know, one thing, uh, you know, we did this presentation uh, back in December um, at the American Muslim Health Professionals Summit uh, in DC. Uh, that's kind of, that's originally where we did this and we met Ramiz there and he asked us to join, uh, uh, you know, join you guys here today and do this presentation because it's something that I think a lot of children go through and it's, as Rami said, it's not really talked about, um, whether it's in our community or outside the community. And then there's just a lot of bullying going on, you know, generally in the country right now. Um, you know, I won't say who, because of the election or anything uh, like that, but it seems like, you know, a year ago, um, you know, hate crime specifically, but just, you know, bullying, just being, you know, not so good to each other uh, took, a, a escalated a little bit. And, um, to that point, I actually want to encourage any everybody. Today is election day here in Illinois, and, and I would encourage any of you, you know, who haven't voted yet, to go out and vote. Um, is there anything you want to add before we uh, jump in? Well, I just want to say that um, you know, bullying is an important topic, and we're not just going to be dealing with it amongst children. It does definitely affects our children. It's present in schools. It's also present in workplaces and present in our society at large. So this presentation is for adults, children, and everyone in between. So we'll jump in now and define what bullying is. So I'm just gonna read uh, you know, the definition uh, from the Webster uh, Dictionary. And uh, the actual definition that they have is it's, it's a use of superior strength or influence to intimidate someone typically to force him or her to do what one wants. And one distinction that we wanna make here is that you know, it's it's influence. It's intimidating someone. Um, it's not physical contact. Um, when physical contact happens, it's no longer bullying. It then it becomes assault. And so, a lot of what we're talking about today is not assault. Um, it's really about bullying and how one becomes a bully. Um, you know, and so we want to make sure when we apply what we're talking about today, it's really specific to bullying and not assault. Because when assault happens, it's actually um, really important to get the authorities involved and get you know people like the principal or you know depending on where it's at, maybe even the police. So that's not, so we're not talking about physical violence here. We're talking about bullying and influence and when people are coercing each other um, you know, into doing things that they want them to do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, normally, uh, you know, this, so this is kind of the first time we're doing a webinar here, but normally in our presentation, we would ask the audience to do, you know, a, a share. And what we're going to do, and we'll do it ourselves here, is, you know, um, an example of when maybe we have been bullies or when we actually were bullied. Steve, do you have an example to share? Yeah, I remember in first grade, I was very nervous uh, when I first entered first grade. I lived in a very rural community and my clothes were kind of didn't fit very well. And I can remember a kid coming up to me and saying he was gonna throw me in a trash can mm. um, the first couple of days of school. And so I felt scared and I felt sort of isolated. And we're gonna talk about what happens to take on sort of a victim mentality, but I definitely felt myself shrinking at that point. Right. Yeah, uh, shrinking is a key word there that often happens when we're in the face of bullies, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. My example is um, probably around the same age, six years, seven years old. I remember, um, you know, my grandmother, who was a pivotal uh, woman in my life, but one of the things that she did was she taught us, um, you know, she taught us the Quran and she taught us religion, but she did it in a way that to me felt like a bully because it was you know, very much in my face and very much, um, you know, you have to learn this and you have to do it. But what I felt was, you know, I had no control in the situation. And so in actuality, it made me resent her. And for a very long time, made me, made me even resent what I was learning. I wasn't, you know, it wasn't for love of Allah. It wasn't for love of God. It wasn't for love of religion. We were really taught, you know, uh, basically that God is a punishing God. 
And so it was just really presented in a very domineering way that I felt like very shrinked and, you know, really small in front of this woman. So, mm -hmm. all right, uh, next. Um, so there's popular beliefs about bullies. So you hear a lot about bullies, you know, in the workplace or in uh, society. And here's some misconceptions that we have with bullies. You know, bullies are insecure. You know, that's a, that's a, uh, that's a big misconception. Now, one thing that we want to put here, these are some common misconceptions. It doesn't apply 100% to every situation, to everyone, but across the board, when you take the average mean, you know, these are some popular misconceptions. Not all, or most bullies are not insecure. Most bullies, um, you know, don't have friends. Actually, um, what we've learned is that bullies have a very a big social circle. And part of the reason why they're actually bull are bullying is, is to impress that social circle. And the other uh, misconception is that only some people bully. So uh, one thing that we also want to make clear here is that bullying and, you know, taking on the victim are roles that we all play. So at different times of the day, different times, you know, in our lives, we might be a bully. We might be a bully to our children. We might be a bully to our spouse. And we could also be bullied by our spouse or be bullied, say, by our parents or our boss. You know, so so these are common misconceptions that we're trying to break here that everybody can be a bully and everybody can be bullied. Yeah. And so as Asif said, we tell ourselves stories about bullies like, oh, like, you know, a child comes home from school f complaining about being bullied and a parent may say, oh, well, that child's just really insecure. That's why you've been bullied. That may be a nice thing to say, but the truth is it doesn't, first of all, get to the child's pain about being bullied. And second of all, it's not necessarily true. A lot of bullies tend to be confident. The reason that they're bullying is because they're confident. So, and, and even people who get bullied or who bully will not bully if they're in a situation where they are outnumbered or overpowered. They'll only bully in a situation where they no, the outcome is already assured that they're going to get support and they're going to be able to dominate the other. They do tend to be popular and strong social standing. So you can have the stereotype of the lonely child who doesn't have any friends who picks on kids. That's what we typically think of. But if you think about it, there's also sometimes the stereotype of like the really popular athlete who bullies people who are less popular in front of their friends and that's how they gain more support. This is actually a more common um, look at bullying and when we talk about society wide, one of the ways that people can consolidate power, and it's been you know, going on for thousands of years, is for a leader to pick on a, my, a powerless minority. And when the leader picks on that powerless minority and asserts power and dominance over that minority, what happens is the audience will rally behind that leader and it gets some more popularity and more social standing. Um, so it's important to also understand that bullying the way we're looking at it oftentimes needs an audience in order for it to really work. It's not just one person being mean to another. It's actually the person who's being bullied is not even the focus of bullying. It's the audience that is the focus. It's a show in order to gain social dominance. Um, and the other thing is it's part of, in a sense, natural dominance behavior in that we see with a lot of animals you see this kind of bullying. If there's like the the head lion and a pride of lions will bully the less dominant males in order to establish dominance. You see it in primates as well. So it, it sort of does seem like a natural phenomenon. And when you look at any kind of society, especially that involves social hierarchies, bullying is a natural part of that society. And you have people who become the bullied, the victim, and the bystanders. Those three roles exist in all bullying situations. Cool. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, so now what we're going to do is turn a little bit to transactional analysis. The reason we chose for analysis is that, you know, in our master's degree work, we've looked at, um, you know, we've looked at actually many subjects through six different lenses, um, you know, from neuroscience to psychology to developmental and what we chose was what kind of really when we were starting to look at the bullying data what really made sense was transactional analysis and you know really the father of transactional analysis eric Byrne. 
you know, he, he really came to prominence in the 1960s with a uh, book called Games People Play. And what that book uh, describes is how we as human beings, you know, interact with each other, um, interact with each other in different relationships. So sometimes we try to one up each other and sometimes we actually try to one down each other rather than playing at the same level. And Steve's going, going to go into a little bit more about how this plays into uh, bullying. All right. Give me the slide. So in transactional analysis, according to Eric Burns theory, he looks at three roles that we play. He talks about the parent role. That's sort of the one up role. So if I explain to Asif why it's really important for him to, to really look at bullying in his life versus talk to him as an equal, now all of a sudden I'm a parent, I'm going one up on him. Um, the other role is the adult role. The adult role is sort of the ideal that we're all in and that we're all equal. So if I say to Asif, you know, let's talk about bullying. This is something I've experienced. You know, have you experienced? I'm talking to him in a right. mutual way. Now we're both equals. The other, the third role is the one down role. What Eric Byrne talks about is the child role. That would be me coming to Asif and whining about how I was bullied at work. <laughs> um, and now I'm putting him in the parent position and I want him to tell me what to do or to say something to help me feel better. The thing that, the reason these three roles are so important is because oftentimes we aren't just interacting with other people on an adult to adult role. There's all sorts of ways at work with your spouse, at home, with your parents, that you can go from one of these. And when you do, um, this, when we look at bullying through this lens, a lot is revealed. So how many times do you say something condescending to your spouse um, as a way to get a one-up? I know that I've done that before. She usually doesn't like it, and she calls me right back <laughs> on it. And then we go adult to adult. But I'm as equally apt to go one down and come in, um, you know, as a child looking for someone to kind of help or, or solve the problem. When we talk about bullying, I want to give actually one example of okay. that because I've got a good example of how I started to take a child role on. Um, you know, this was a few years back when I was working with, um, you know, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, a colleague of mine, and. We, he was the project manager and I was the architect. And we had worked with each other for two to three years and we had a very adult to adult relationship. And all of a sudden what happened was that at, at um, you know, three years um, into our relationship, he actually ended up becoming my boss. And quite naturally and quite unconsciously, I started, you know, I raised him to a higher platform than me and I was coming at him from a very child role just because he became my boss. It was kind of instinctive where, you know, before I would just talk to him, you know, at, as equals. Now I was coming to him with questions or kind of explain to me how this should happen or just in a very, um, you know, just unconscious way how I put myself into that relationship. It wasn't until a few months into it, I'm like, what just happened here? I, somehow our relationship has changed now just because you're my boss. And you know, once I started thinking about it consciously, then I brought myself back up to an adult to adult relationship with him. Mm. But it was very, I mean, this example, how it just happened. <laughs> yeah, great example. Um, I know that I've at times um, shared, you know, I could think of a time, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago where I was co-facilitating a group with someone and there was this sort of tension between us that it, we had an opportunity to work it out adult to adult. But I actually took a step down and took a little bit of that child role and sort of asked her kind of like, what did she need? So in a, which I guess in a way I won up because I asked her what she needed and took care of her. But there's also a way I stepped down from being an authority and, and, and being equal with her and made it my role to kind of take care of her almost like a child with a mother. So it's a, it's kind of went back and forth actually went, went in the same interaction. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily, it wasn't bullying, but it's example of how, when you look at transactional analysis, you can track in a conversation, you can move up and down those roles many times in a single conversation. Now, how is this re relevant to specifically to bullying? When you do a bullying bid to someone, you come in as that, uh, parent and try to make someone go into a child role. If I'm being bullied at work, if someone comes and makes some comments and I stay in my adult, I don't necessarily um, 
allow myself to get bullied. But as soon as someone tries to have come one up on me and I go one down, that's what we're really looking at in terms of bullying through transactional analysis. Correct. It's the attempt to dominate someone and have someone drop down into a lesser role. Right. And and that's what bullies want to do, right? They, they want to dominate. And here's some characteristics of a bully, right? They have a desire to dominate and subdue others to get their own way, right? They can be defiant and aggressive towards authority, especially authority that they consider illegitimate. They show little empathy toward those who are victimized. And this is a real key thing here because one of the ways we'll talk about later is once you start feeling empathy for the person you're bullying, you tend not to bully them anymore. Um, the other characteristic is that they tend to be physically stronger than those that, uh, than those that they bully. Um, so what's, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit before. What's one way or a couple of ways that we tend to be bullies in our lives? Well, I can say that one of the things I've been called on many times is being a know-it-all. And being a know-it-all is a great way to kind of use my knowledge to one-up someone. Um, and I've done that at work. Um, you know, I've definitely done that with, with my wife. And um, different places I've worked, it's like I wanted to be the person who had the answers, which is a way of trying to go to a little bit of a superior position. And I've right. gotten called on it. People don't feel that mutuality. They feel that trust or mutual respect with me when I'm trying to be a little know-it-all who wants them to sort of come to me for answers. Right. Yeah, one example for me is more and more now that my daughter, I mean, she's 21 now and she's becoming more and more of an adult. And, you know, I, I could probably get away with bullying a little bit when she was younger. Um, and but now, like, she'll call me out on it. Like she's studying um, urban planning now. And when I try to have a conversation on a subject that she's more of an expert on, she's just like, Dad, I've studied this. I know this. How, why are you trying to one up uh, on me in this conversation? And we try to now tend to go back to a more adult adult conversation than that. So. <laughs> right. And, and I'll just say, I'll go a level deeper for me is I'm very politically opinionated. Okay. And one of the things that, that, you know, we'll talk about is, is how that's usually, it can be very unproductive of political discourses, especially I know I will come in with the perspective of, I kind of have the answer and that the other answers are right. not really very helpful. And when you really take a step back and see that, we live in a very polarized sort of political situation in our country where everyone has their own little news outlet and their own media and is so focused on making the other people wrong. I've come to see that me coming in with a strong opinion, thinking it's right and that others are wrong is a form of bullying and it's not productive. Right. right. So characters of the victim so, role. So, so just like the bully has a, has a certain role. I know in my work, teaching children, and I was a teacher for 17 years, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, sometimes there were bullying situations, and sometimes there were kids that kept finding themselves falling into a bully situation. And so one of the things I came to see is that there are certain characteristics of a victim role. And I can, I'll talk more about my childhood, but I talked about first grade being bullied. I sort of fell into this classic victim role. And there are certain characteristics that make us easy targets for bullying. And there's also even sometimes victims out there looking for bullies. And that's what I was, you know, in my, you know, early elementary school, because that was my relationship with my sister. She would sort of bully me, I would get bullied, and that's how I looked for attention. So one thing is to become passive and submissive. Um, another is to be cautious, sensitive, quiet, withdrawn, and shy. So, you know, what we've learned about neuroscience is that there are, um, when you feel threatened, there's two sets of responses. There's the fight and flight response, and then there's the freeze response. So someone who constantly or consistently chooses the free, freeze response actually sets themselves up to be bullied. Similarly, if a, when a bully, you know, I told you I was bullied. I remember a time being bullied in seventh grade. There was a kid who came up and said some things to me that were, I found humiliating, and I just found myself shrinking. He tried to say the same thing to a child, to a kid who was much smaller than me, and that kid just met his energy, was angry and defiant, and he never met a freeze response. I went to shrinking, I became anxious, insecure, unhappy. Um, and the other thing that is really characteristic of this victim role is to start to ignore your own feelings and to feel that the feelings of others are more important. You can see this in, you know, I also work as a couples therapist. And one of the things I see, which is really fascinating, is, is a, 
a, a person who has a lot of resentment towards their spouse, part of the reason they got so resentful is that in this situation or that situation, they would ignore their own feelings. If, you know, maybe the spouse had a strong opinion about what they're going to do this weekend, they would ignore that feeling and allow them to have their way. So it's taking the child roles, taking one down, and by constantly ignoring the feelings, they start to feel like a victim, and then they empower the others to constantly be making those decisions, and then they start to feel like they're being bullied. What they don't realize is that there's a way that they're creating it by taking on that victim role. Do you want to say something about that? I think we jumped into, I mean, it, so that that's taken on the victim role, and then there's a chronic victim, right? Which right. is uh, similar to what kind of what you're talking about, where people like do this day to day, and it continues, right? Um, and it's something that's we'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's someone that has low self esteem, right? And one of the things that we want to talk about is why does that child have low self esteem, right? It, it has to do with parenting, and um, you know, and we'll talk about it later. But um, so it's just something to keep in your back of your mind, like. You know, people look or bully. Sorry, when a, when someone's taken on that bullying role, they will try to find someone that's physically smaller than them. But they will also try to find someone that has low self esteem because they know chances are that that person is not going to fight back, right? Mm -hmm. Because they will give in to the bully. They will take everything that the bully is throwing at them, and they will not do anything. And and it's a pattern type thing. You know, once. I pick on you and you haven't done anything to stop me from bullying, I'm going to pick on you the next day and that's going to continue. It's going to become a pattern. Um, so another thing of the chronic victim is that they're depressed and they're often uh, socially isolated. Uh, they're not popular and uh, don't have strong social networks and they tend to be uh, you know, physically weaker um, on the average. So um, one thing we want to jump into is now so we described the bully and then we described the victim. And now we're going to look at the transaction between the bully and the victim. Right. And, and let's take a step back and, and look at the big picture of this, because what we're describing is a is a moment to moment interaction of bullying and victiming. What we want to be clear about is, is not to say that every time someone is bullied, that they've created it or called it in. What we're looking at are patterns. Right. And this is also where it's really important to make that distinction between bullying and assault. So and I and this and, and one thing is and this is not also victim blaming, right? Because we right. can get very fine line about victim blaming. It's not about victim blaming, but it's like how are we more apt to take on that victim role? Right. And it and the reason it's important to see that we have that when we fall into that role, we encourage the bully is not to blame us for when we do that. But it's actually empowering because it means that by we by and we'll talk about this later more. But by staying in the adult, we actually start to balance that power out. But again, when you have um, a situation where there's you know threat, physical threat, when you have a situation where someone's really outnumbered, these things sort of fall to the wayside. So we just want to be really clear that we're not saying right. to blame the victim. So if I you know if I say something you know, mean to Asif, you know, he can take it different ways and that can create a different relationship. But if I come with five of my friends um, and key his car, that's clearly at a different, at a different level. There's not like right. the way he can, you know, by, by shifting out of that role. Well, when there's outcome. physical violence, I mean, what we always say is your number one job is to survive. Your number one job is to get out of that. You don't do anything to inflame the situation, um, you know, or cause more harm, it, you know, so some things we talk about later, uh, you know, when you're in the victim role and standing up to a bully, that's, again, when it's bullying, when it's physical assault, when there's life danger, you know, potential life danger that's happening, you know, your number one aim is to get out of that, right? And so these rules don't necessarily apply in those situations. Right. So I can talk about a time when I was in the seventh, uh, I guess it was high school, because I think it was driver's ed class. There was a kid who came up and he was, he pushed me and was using, you know, basically bullying me. And so I stood up to him. This was a moment where I was learning to assert myself. I stood up and I pushed him back. Well, he turned around and he kind of like, he was, I didn't realize he was a karate guy and he kicked me in the face. So my nose was bleeding. So we've gone from bullying to assault. But here's the thing. He never messed with me after that. Even though he got the best of me in that interaction because I stood up to him and he realized I wasn't going to be an easy victim, he sort of left me alone. So here's an so 
when somebody bullies and somebody stay, you know, so if we're adult to adult here, if somebody tries to step up, what I did is I stayed in my place. So he came back down to my level, but had I gone one down now we're in a bullying situation. That pattern persists and can, and right. stays going. Um, do you have a story you want to tell about that? Well, I just want to clear, I mean, cut, cause we're talking about the transaction here. So, Again, back to what Steve was saying. So you've got the adult to adult and the bully tries to take on the parent role. And this, so the bullying situation only works when we take on the child role, right? It's our choice now to either stay in that position or come back down to take on that child role. And that's what the bully wants. He actually wants to put us in that child role. Right. Right. So, um, so I'm, I can't think of anything. Well, when right I was now, in, so I was... I, when I was in seventh grade, I I had a, a group that I used to hang out with. There were skateboarders, okay. and one of those kids, you know, the, the way it worked is there was a social hierarchy. There was two leaders. There were about five guys in the middle, and me and this other kid were on the bottom. So we were already one down. We were in that sort of child role. So at one point, one of the leaders gave me an egg, and he wanted me to throw it at the other kid that was on the bottom of the social pile. Mm. So I did it. And then the other kid came back and wanted to fight me. So we all went outside and now we were set up to have this fist fight. So already we have allowed ourselves to get drawn into this drama. You know, he, he, me and these other guy in the bottom were probably the close, he was the close, we were the closest to each other in this group. Now we're pitted against each other. The key though here is that the leaders were doing this to get the attention of the middle group, the audience. That was actually their base of power. If it was just the four of us, it probably wouldn't happen. Right. So me and this kid get in a fist fight. Um, I punched him out pretty good. And the truth is I got some cheers and I felt terrible after that. It didn't, I, I didn't feel any better. The, the, the two leaders felt a lot better and I actually broke my hand. And I don't know if you can see, I have a big scar on my hand <laughs> here left over from this, from this yeah. wound. Yeah. And I tried to reconnect to this wow. kid afterwards and that friendship was over. Right. He actually got me back in high school when we were on a mock <laughs> trial and he was the judge and, so he held but on to it for <laughs> he held on to it but but the point is is you know i could have said no if i had stayed in the adult right. i wouldn't have thrown the egg or yeah. would have backed yeah. away from being in that fight so i actually went from being bullied to switching into the bully role all as a result of me not being able to manage my own sense of self yeah no actually as you were talking i, I thought of a situation that happened when i was young as well i, I think i was probably in um, high school late high school and you know there was me my best friend in the car my brother in the back and i remember uh, my brother said something to my best friend and uh, my best friend didn't like what he said and you know he had my brother get out of the car you know and my brother had just uh, he had a uh, something happened where he was limping you know he had hurt his leg or whatever and this was the chance for me so this was a chance as a bystander now, you know, cause I felt like my best friend was bullying, um, you know, my brother here and I did not do anything, right? So this is where I actually probably more than my best friend being a bully to my brother, I actually became a bully to my brother because I didn't stand up for him, you know? And that's something that um, I, I was, I felt awful about because it didn't make me feel good with my brother now that I thought about it. But the reason I did that was to, you know, um, ally with my best friend because I wanted him to like me or continue to like me and continue for us to be friends. But I was horrible to my brother um, in, in that situation. And, you know, we talked about it a few years later um, and kind of repaired that relationship, but it stood and I felt horrible for months, you know, even at that point. So that's another interaction there. Wow. And there's a yeah. lot of painful oh, stories right. <laughs> about, you know, you know, me feeling bullied by my sister and then me passing that on to my mm -hmm. brother so okay. I could get in that dominant position. Right. It's important to note that there huh. is, you know, from a neuroscience perspective, we do get this little hit of dopamine when we bully. It gets a surge and, and people can get addicted to that. But what the research actually shows is that having a mutual interaction with someone actually hits a much more satisfying uh, center of our brain. Right. I mean, back to neuroscience and what you're talking about, because we want that immediate high, right? I mean, and, you know, what we don't recognize uh, a lot of the time is how to be more satisfied in our lives, right? And go for more satisfaction. And that's uh, another thing that we learned, um, you know, in our graduate school, because uh, that 
that dopamine hit, when it happens, we want more of it. We want more of it. We crave more for it. But it's it's just like any other drug, you know. It's not eventually going to satisfy you. And so shifting from that immediate hit to getting something that is more satisfying, and that's building the relationship, building more adult-to-adult -adult relationships yeah. is kind of the, the key way to getting out of bullying and even getting out of victim roles. Because a lot of times we, we stay stuck in our victim role because we feel like, okay, maybe someone's going to feel sorry for us. Maybe we're going to make friends that way because, um, you know, that's the only way we knew how, probably in our families, to get attention, right? Yeah. And, we're, I mean, we'll dig into that some more um, in a bit as well. Um, so now we're, we're, we're going to jump into, you know, the, the things that make a bully, right? So we're talking about parenting and we're talking about childhood, you know, um, uh, and this really from – from the research that we've looked into, um, it really plays a big part into you know, how a bully is made. You know, uh, there's really two or three things in, um, that we're going to talk about here. The first thing is, you know, the emotional attitude of the primary caregiver is hugely influential, especially in the first couple years. Definitely, um, you know, uh, the, the, the data shows that our emotional state is formed, 70% of it is formed in the first two years of our lives. And then the next 30% is formed from the ages of uh, you know two to seven. So th that's a very critical time of how we you know relate to our emotions and how we relate to others. And so if usually, you know, if a mom has a lack of warmth, that's going to you know influence. And again, this is back to not a hundred percent all the time, but you know, these are some of the key metrics that go into uh, you know making a bully. So lack of warmth, essentially a negative emotional attitude characterized by a lack of warmth and involvement increases the risk of a child to let it later become aggressive and hostile toward others. So that's one point. Second point is permissiveness for aggressive behavior by the child. So if the primary caretaker is generally permissive or tolerant without setting clear limits on aggressive behavior, either toward peers, siblings, or adults, then the child's aggression is likely to increase as he grows older. The third thing that makes a bully or can make a bully is how power is asserted toward the child himself or herself. You know, child rearing method, methods such as physical punishment and violent emotional outbursts. You know, like children of parents who make frequent use of these methods are likely to become more aggressive than their average child. You know, violence begets violence. And, you know, the last thing is too little love and care and too much freedom. So this is a balance, right? It's not about, you know, being on one end or the other end. So too much of anything, too little love or too much freedom in childhood are conditions that contribute strongly to the development of aggressive uh, reaction patterns by the child. Yeah, in the parenting literature, there's three parenting styles. Permissive, authoritative, and authoritarian. Authoritative is that middle ground. It's setting limits, being clear, having consequences with love. Authoritarian is do it my way or the highway, and that sets a pattern. That gives the children a pattern to follow. Right. I, you, you, you dominate others to get your way. And like you said, the permissive can lead to all sorts of things. Right. They have no kids actually need boundaries. It creates yeah. safety for them to know what the rules are specifically of, you know, what they can do and what they can't do and what the consequences are if they break those rules. And, you know, when you don't have that, kids think they can do anything, you know, I mean, and that's really a big part of, you know, what goes into this. So that's bullying. And now, uh, you know, what are some of the things that go into becoming a victim? Well, I know that for myself, I mean, one of the ways that I got attention, I talked about how I felt I was bullied by my sister. But guess what? One of the ways I got attention was <laughs> to antagonize her <laughs> and to encourage that bullying behavior because right. it was attention. It felt good. It, it was a little addictive too. I remember a time, and this isn't exactly bullying, but I remember in middle school, there were these two girls that I think were a grade above me in the seat behind me. I so wanted their attention. So I, I turn around and I talk to them and I don't, I remember it being really annoying and I could feel their annoyance as I was talking, but I couldn't, it's almost like I couldn't stop because I was getting their mm -hmm. attention. And it was that piece where I was getting that little hit. I was getting that, that satisfaction of getting their attention. And I was feeling this inner sense of, I don't know, humiliation or just not, 
feeling good because I wasn't going for that other piece. I wanted that connection. So I would play the fool and then call in that somebody doing the one up to me so mm. I could, you know, feel better. Huh. Um, so when we're willing to give up our adult ego state um, and become a child, and as Asif said, sometimes it's because that's how we got sympathy in our home. You know, the little brother syndrome where you go, you go whining to, to mom and dad and then a big brother, big sister get in trouble. If that becomes a pattern, we can start to do that throughout our lives. Nice. Um, you know, sometimes it feels like we don't have it's it's too scary to stand up for for ourselves and if we feel we don't feel like we have the right to be respected so it's easy to go to that victim place we don't feel like we have the right to to be on our own um yeah i i, I actually relate to that one quite a bit you know i was talking about my grandmother earlier um you know who was very domineering right and that i think that created in my mind that i didn't have a right to be respected and where that came up then was in my marriage you know, because I always felt like because I had to please my grandmother growing up, a part of me um, thought that I needed to please my uh, wife, um, you know, in our relationship. And, you know, and so I would one up her like it's not even something that she wanted, but I would bring myself down to the child state in relationship with her. And, you know, and all she wanted was a partner in the relationship. But my behavior pattern or kind of what I grew up with was, you know, kind of putting myself down to this grandmother and I carry that into my marriage. Yeah. I, I know for myself, one of the lessons I learned pretty quickly in my adult professional life was I, when, when people would give me feedback about my performance, I would look at it that it was a personal attack hmm. and I would take a victim stance in it. And why did I do that? Maybe because as a child, um, criticism was used against me as a weapon by, you know, in my family, fine. But the, the other piece is, it was really painful to take full responsibility for what I was creating. So sometimes we take a victim stance because it's difficult to take real responsibility for any situation <coughs> we're in. So it's easier just to blame others than to step up. Right. So we got, just be conscious, we got 20 minutes left here. Okay. Few more slides to get through so so we're giving a lot of background we're really hoping that you're seeing how there's this moment-to-moment -moment interaction that can lead to dominance or submissive behavior but let's take it back now to the big picture of bullying you know what happens when you're in a situation and somebody comes in it could be a co-worker it could be a spouse it could be a, a neighbor, it could be someone out of the blue you don't know, and you're feeling like you're getting bullied. And this is both if you're an adult or you're a student in school. How do you handle a bullying situation? Okay. I think what we want to do is give an example. And I think what we should do here is give two different examples. One, where we actually go down to the child level uh, as an example of what maybe what not to do, and then we'll come back next with an example of kind of how to stay in that adult. Okay, so we're going to role play it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah I think All that's right. the best way. Um, which one do you want to be? Why don't you start with the bully, and I'll be the victim, and I'll I'll, I'll be victimized, Okay. and then we'll switch it around, and I'll try to bully you, and you show okay. how it doesn't work. All right, cool. Uh, you know, this is just a terrible matching of clothes that you have here. You know, it's just like gray on gray on gray. It's like boring. Oh. You now, who picked this out for you? Did your mommy pick this? Pick these clothes out no. for you? And she, your hair, I mean, you should have put some gel in that hair. Oh. You know, it's just like sticking up and, you know, it just looks horrible. Well, uh, at least I have hair. At least. I mean, not, it's just ugly. It's not, even, it's not, you know, if I'm actually glad I don't have hair if I had hair that looked like that. Wow. <laughs> So, so this is where you kind of, so as an example, you just, I kept attacking you because you, you first, you shied away that way yeah. and you, you really like diminished Shrinking. and you didn't give me any reason to kind of stop and you were defending and really kind of taking on that child. Right. Role. And the shot back, I don't know if you could feel it, but there was no power in that shot. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I could it was feel an ineffective that. Correct. attempt to attack. Right. Because if I felt it, then it was an attack back at me which i knew um you know really could kind of come back at you right. again at a higher level even though it was a shot back mm -hmm. right so it had a little power because i felt it but the thing is 
you know, I, all I wanted to do is one up on you. But yeah, exactly. That, right? So yeah. it wasn't, um, it wasn't at the same level. Because uh, yeah. if you came back with, and we'll demonstrate this after what, because it was a shot and you tried to take dominance over, but it didn't stop me from trying to retake uh, dominance. Well, let's actually go, let, let's do the same thing and then I'll demonstrate it. Then we'll do a switcheroo. Okay. Should we do that? Okay. So we're. Uh, yeah, just say I'm, the same thing. Like you're attacking me now, and instead okay. of me going into victim or trying gotcha. to do ineffective counterattacks, I'll okay. stay in my adult role. Right. God, that's just such a horrible outfit. Um, you know, who put that together for you? Did, do you dress yourself? I do you dress myself, yeah. You don't like this one. No, I don't. I like, well, this um, is a nice jacket. I guess it would have been nice to put in a little bit more color now that you mentioned it. I didn't even <laughs> realize I did that. Yeah, and I got nowhere to go. I mean, so it's just like when I so when you come back at me like that, I'm like just thinking, wow, he just made a nice comment to me, and I just don't even know what to say at this point. So instead so of defending just, or counterattacking, right. I'm I'm. You're, stay, you're, you're staying. You're staying in your adult. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Okay. <laughs> so you know, now I'll be mean to you, and you could we could okay. do both sides. Okay. So us, if you're into IT. That's kind of boring, huh? Do you ever do anything? No, fun? it's not boring. It's such an exciting career. Oh, I mean, really I've been exciting. <laughs> on the computer. Hey, screw, screw yeah, you, dude. Do you ever dude. do any real sunlight? How's yeah, I get out all. Yeah, I get. Uh, like in the cubicle. I I go out all the time. I take breaks Gilbert all the Connor. time. Okay. Yeah, that that and that felt awful. So I, I definitely <laughs> felt a, like a child in that relation in, in that interaction. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So and it hurt. <laughs> so it hurt, and he had, you know, and he was defending it, and like, no, I'm not. Right. So that's a, a clear victim role. So let's try it again. Okay. So, Asif, you're in IT. That sounds pretty boring. Uh, you know uh, what? What do you do for? What do you do for a living? Like, I, I'd like to know more about what you do. Oh, I'm a teacher. That sounds really exciting. You know, um, I wonder if I can, you know, as an IT professional, also teach. Might be uh, something for me to look into. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess. Is, do, you ever, do they ever let you out of your cubicle? Uh, I don't know. How, how, what's your teaching environment? You know, I, I, do you, are you in cubicles or, I mean, you're in a classroom, right? Yeah, we're in a classroom. Yeah, that, that sometimes... sounds exciting to be in a classroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's not just always agreeing with it but but you see how it's like it's not getting hooked it's not you right. know so this goes to the conversation about unfinished business right um well, well let's talk let's well, talk about the bystander role real quick okay. and, and then we'll come back to um well so let's just say that. when when we're defending something when we have a part of us that feels like that we feel insecure about and we start to defend and clamp down on it, it makes it easier to be bullied than if we're just like cool with ourselves. Right. But we'll, we'll, we'll go back to that. Yeah, we'll come back to that. I mean, the, the one thing, because this is really important, you know, the bystander role is critically important. One of the things is if you're a bystander and you don't do anything, you're actually taking the side of the bully. All right. So that's definitely one piece of it. The other piece of it is, you know, bystanders, a lot of times they're the ones who are egging on the bully, you know, the bully by himself or herself is not the one that even sometimes wants to do this. They feel like that social pressure. They feel like they're going to get attention. They're going to impress. And, you know, and so that bystander role is really critical. Right. So when we've done this in person, we do role plays where we have people kind of demo what we did. And we there's a bystander. So they go into threes. Right. It's challenging to get that same visceral effect when it's just two of us here. Correct, but, but I think. Yeah. But but as Asif said, there's you know there's a whole uh, spectrum of bystander responses. Um, one is the act of bullying on. So when I talked about when I got in that fight with my friend in seventh grade, we had the two bullies and the whole group of audience were egging on that fight. That's the worst <laughs> case scenario for bystander. Right. But if people pull out their iPhones and they're recording it. That's almost just it's the same bad. thing. Yeah. It's the same thing. You know, I'm amazed sometimes when I, the internet videos I see, I'm like, who's watching, who's right. recording that? Why aren't they doing something? Yeah. So to actually disengage and, and be, you know, ignore the bullying behavior is a step in the right direction. But there's actually um, other steps that are far more positive than, than that. And the two really powerful things a bystander can do is one, they can stand up and say something. But the other thing they can do is they can really they can ignore the bully and connect to the person right. being bullied, because again, when someone's being bullied and they 
um, all, you know, they start to feel really isolated because no one else is around helping them and they're disconnected and, and then they take that one down. So somebody reaches out and say, hey, are you okay? Make eye contact or even just start talking to them. That can actually um, flip the, ener the energy around and, and give that bystander or get, sorry, give the victim social support and break the spell that the bullying is creating. And, and it's a twofold uh, thing that actually happens. So you're giving uh, emotional support to that person but also you're taking the audience away from the bully. So if you're focused just on the victim and really ignoring the bully, they have no one to perform for anymore. And that also, um, you know, not all the cases, but a lot of times will cause them to disengage and go away. Right, because it's threatening them to be ignored. Right. And if they turn on you, the, so the fear of every bystander right, is, is gonna... the bully's gonna turn on you. And in some situations that happens, but often, there's this, there's this principle of leadership called the first follower. As soon as one person stands up, they've broken the spell. And now there's a much greater likelihood a third person will stand up. But more right. than that, um, as soon as you have the bully now and the bystander together, you have a much more powerful force in that isolated uh, victim, especially well, because- Well, the bystander and the victim, I think. Right, right? Yeah. Did I say, yeah, you said bully. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The bystander and the victim create a, a two, and that's a much more powerful force. Okay. Especially because yeah. by standing up, you're automatically stepping into the adult role, not taking a one down role. Okay. So the last thing we want to talk about is unfinished business. And, you know, unfinished business is a term really coined by another person from the human potential movement uh, whose name was uh, Fitz Pearls. And, you know, it's really um, uh, what I described earlier, you know, how my grandmother, the interaction with my grandmother now came into, um, you know, uh, into my marriage right so it's about our past interactions and how they um you know impact our present day interactions you know he talks about you know our life is full of unfinished business and we move from one unfinished business to another i mean that's just kind of normal um but where it becomes troubling is when a piece of unfinished business becomes a focus uh, where we become really uh, obsessed and emotionally it overpowers us and it, it has a you know a capacity uh, to really stop us from you know what, what Steve talked about from freezing in the face of you know um, something that's coming at us right so um, so so where it's important is you know working on our unfinished business and this is also very important in parenting you know because uh, a lot of times what happens and we talked about the authoritative and you know the passive when we're dealing with our children you know we get scared when we don't have the answers when we don't know what to do and you know when we tell them do what we say you know that's because of our own unfinished business and we have not worked our unfinished business to a satisfactory level and what we encourage you know um what we encourage uh, folks to do is to look at our unfinished business and you know first is becoming aware that we even have unfinished business and then second is um you know doing something about that unfinished business and Ramiz, i don't know later on if we'll have ways to communicate with our audience but you know uh part of what we do is you know we um offer seminars you know our graduate school we don't offer seminars but where we got our graduate school degree uh, you know is a place where we've gone to work on our own unfinished business and we encourage others to also come and you know work on their unfinished business right yeah and so it's important so if you're a parent and your child um you know gets bullied at school or, or, or somebody says something mean to them let's say a teacher says something to your child you don't like i'm willing to bet there's some things where the teacher says and you're like right on i agree good for her and some things you'll be like oh my gosh i can't believe she said that and then you want to go in and give her a piece of your mouth a uh, piece of your mind chances are that thing that one makes that triggers you is something to do with your unfinished unfin right. business but as an adult, you can look at what are the things that really trigger you? You know, the things that really trigger you, you know, I have talked about my clothes. I, that doesn't really trigger me. I don't have unfinished business about that. So it's easy for me to sort of defend. But, you know, he knows me well enough. He's going to find that thing that is really going to get me. And then I'm going to be upset. And, it, and, and it's, you know, if you get really triggered, it's hard to stay in that adult state. So right, that's why it's right. important to work on it. It's not like we we're trying to say this is all a choice and you can just, you know, mm, I'm adult. 
we all have those things that trigger us into another state. And that's, and that's a good we indicator, actually. So hijack is a term, amygdala hijack, is when we get into that fight, flight, freeze mode. And that's a good indicator, actually, when we get into that mode that we have some unfinished business. And some common things that we talk about, you know, bullies, what's their unfinished business? You know, a lack of trust. They didn't have a whole lot of security growing up, so they have a lack of trust, and that's unfinished business for them to work on. You know, they think that only their needs can only get met by dominating others, so they have this sense that the only way they can survive or get the things that they want in life is by dominating others. It all comes from childhood. So their work is to trust and power with versus powering others, right? So working with others versus the need for having to power others to get the way that they want. And then, you know, that behavior is self-defeating because you lose support and alien and possibly alienating others and possibly allies as well. You wanna talk about um, victims unfinished business? Yeah, so a victim, it's that idea of um, knowing that you matter. And maybe in your your family um, you didn't matter, and you're, it was easier just to stuff emotions, push it, put yourself aside, and sort of disappear. It was easier than standing up for yourself because it can be scary, it can be difficult, and it's if if you're a confident person, it's easy to say just stand up to them. But if you don't have that inner confidence, it can be really challenging. It can seem impossible, and it can feel like you don't even have the right to do it. So that's yeah. your work then is to learn how to really assert and self-care and notice when you're upset. Um, another thing that actually comes to mind for me is, you know, we bullies or victims, you know, we've come up with these coping mechanisms or these ways to navigate through life um, as a way to survive. It's kind of what we did as children to survive. And, you know, I'm reminded of a quote by Jack Mesero who talks about, you know, childhood is formation and adulthood is transformation. So yes, we came up with these days to cope with these ways to cope with life as we were growing up. And they probably worked for us as children. And we were very smart actually to come up with these ideas and ways to cope, but they don't work for us as adults anymore. I mean, can you imagine in the adult place, you know, kind of the example I talked about, you know, shrinking as an employee to my boss. It, that that's not going to necessarily it might work to some degree but ultimately it's not going to work it's not going to work for me as a way to get ahead in my career so the other part of that jack mazur quote is that adulthood is transformation so you know what doesn't work for us now that work for us in childhood we want to be able to transform that into a way of being that actually works for us um you know going forward in our lives absolutely my email address is amasood1 at yahoo.com. So A M A S O O D 1 at yahoo. <laughs> My email is Stephen, S T E V E N dot Thorpe, T H O R P E 7, just the number 7, at gmail.com.